Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this Immutep Investor Call to discuss the company's new clinical results from its phase two tactic 00 trial, 002 trial of its lead product candidate, FD Lardy Mode um, Alpha in patients with lung cancer. My name is Tim McGowan, and I'll be your moderator for today. The format today will be a presentation delivered by Immutep, and at the end of the presentation, we will open the call for analyst questions. I will also relay any other questions received via email prior to this call. I would like to now hand over to Mark Voigt, Immutep CEO, to start the presentation. Mark, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tim. And uh, as usual, our um, forward-looking statement. And a uh, warm welcome, uh, everyone. I thank you all for joining us on the call today. Um, here with me is uh, Frederic Tribel, who is our chief medical and chief scientific officer, and also the person who discovered Lex3, and Christian Müller, our vice president of strategic development. And we are very excited to walk you through the exciting results from our TACTI002 clinical trial, which met its primary objective for first-line non-small cell lung cancer. The trial has been conducted in collaboration with MSD, or in the US known as uh, Merck. And I will uh, just make a few intro slides and then we try to come directly uh, to the data. First of all, I would like to note a few changes in the lex therapeutic landscape. So we see more trials being initiated, uh, notably phase three clinical trials uh, by bristol myers Squibb, by Merck, by Regeneron. So more activity, that's quite good. Um, especially uh, for us. Also, it's, I think it's pretty clear that we will focus today on FT Dagimod Alpha or FT here on the top left-hand side. And just to be very clear, and we have been showing it also at the ESCO, at the oral presentation with thousands of people uh, being present and uh, looking at our data that we have with FT Dagimod a unique MHC class two agonist, so not another version of an immune checkpoint inhibitor, but really a unique program. And we test FT Lagimod in combination uh, with, for instance, uh, pembrolizumab, or some of you know it maybe better as Ketruda, or with chemotherapy, really in a variety of different indications, different combinations in, I believe, a good uh, clinical program. That was already all, and I would uh, like to hand over to Frederic because uh, most important is the data here. Thank you, Mark. Turning to slide 10, let me give you an overview of the TACTIO2 trial, which is testing the combination of FT with Ketruda, also known as Pembrolizumab or Pembro for short, in up to 183 patients at site in Europe, the US and Australia. So today we are presenting results from just part A, first line NLCLC patients. So a total of 114 patients with first line NLCLC were enrolled and treated with FT plus Pembro in six countries across 19 trial sites throughout Europe, the US and Australia. These patients were given the combination therapy of FT and Pembro for up to a year and then progress until Pembro monotherapy for up to another year. And the primary endpoint for these patients is the uh, overall response rate according to iResist and local read. iResist is an accepted measurement standard in trials involving only immunotherapies. So the, the data announced at ASCO and discussed here today represents the primary analysis of mature data of this endpoint. Of course, there are some secondary endpoints, including ORR by resist 1.1, DCR, duration of response, progression-free survival, OS, as well as safety assessment. And we will discuss some of these too. Now let's look at the, uh, on the next slide, at the epidemiology of uh, uh, non-small cell and cancer. There are uh, 1.8 million people diagnosed each year with NLCLC, and uh, it is the most frequent cause of cancer deaths. And roughly 1.3 million people develop metastatic disease and need to receive anti-PD-1 therapy, uh, such as uh, Pembro. 
So this is an unmet medical need as the median overall survival for patients receiving currently available treatments is uh, less than 24 months. The standard of care is doublet chemo plus pembro in patients with a TPS score less than, than 50%. And Pembro alone in patients with a so-called uh, hot tumor phenotype, meaning a TPS score of more than 50%. Slide 12, take us through some of the statistical consideration for the trial. In fact, one of our key assumptions for this part of the trial is that 20 to 23% of patients would have been likely to respond to PEMBRO as a monotherapy according to calculation made from the results of a Keynote 001 and Keynote 042 trials. Uh, in order to get a significant clinical benefit and an improvement by 50%, we uh, estimated that uh, we should uh, get a a response rate of at least 35% for the uh, combined therapy compared to um, 23%. So the design here uh, is of course assignment to stage design. And after implementing stage one and two, there was an expansion phase with a total, as I said, of 114 patients recruited. On slide 13, we provide details around the baseline characteristics of the patients as they enter the trial. So the trial was designed to be unselected for PDL1 status. And as you know, PDL1 is a very important biomarker indicating uh, the likelihood of response to PEMBRO. So this is uh, quite rare as a, as a trial design as most trials focus on patients with uh, PDL1 expression or TPS score more than uh, 50%. And there are examples for that, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, anti TGIT uh, plus uh, um, anti PD1. In TACTIO2, uh, we had patients across the PDL1 expression spectrum. And in fact, more than 70% of patients had a TPS score of less than 50%. So it's really uh, making it an all comer trial. Other patient characteristic uh, reflects uh, uh, what you expect for a late stage uh, non small cell lung cancer. And now moving consider safety on slide 14. Uh, yes, uh, as you see here, uh, we um, combination of FT and PEMBRO was safe and well tolerated. And now if you look in the table on the left, you see grade four TAE and grade five, but of course that doesn't mean this is, uh, this uh, TAE are uh, related to treatment and only uh, uh, 11 patients had to per permanently con discontinue treatment, uh, so less than 10%, and that is what is expected with uh, PEMBRO alone. On the, on the next slide, you see uh, that uh, the um, frequency of uh, adverse event uh, that are related to uh, some uh, immune eti etiology like uh, pneumonitis, we had uh, one grade four, one grade five, hepatitis, we had uh, one grade four. Uh, this is typical of what you see with uh, PEMBRO alone. So overall, the, the safety profile, including of course, immune mediated adverse event due to PEMBRO, is comparable to PEMBRO, PEMBRO monotherapy. The only uh, additional um, toxicity or uh, tolerability uh, symptoms are uh, in 20% of patients, uh, any type of local injection site reactions, inflammation like erythema uh, at the sub-Q injection site. And this is due to the mechanism of action of uh, FT. The, um, which is uh, the uh, activation of, uh, 
for excels locally. So now I will hand over to Christian, Christian Muller, to take you through the key uh, efficacy results. Christian. Thank you, Frederick. I hope everybody can hear me well and I'm more than happy to guide you through this exciting efficacy data today. Looking at slide 16, here we present the key TACTIO2 efficacy results and they are overall response rate and then also disease control as detailed in the table with a cutoff of 15th of April 2022. The primary objective of the trial, the overall response rate according to iResist, as reported here at ESCO, was 38.6% percent in the intent to treat population, which means the most conservative approach uh, in all patients who have been recruited. If you just look for patients who are available for efficacy, meaning they have at least one scan, CT scan after baseline, the response rate according to iResist increases to 42.7 percent. So overall, the trial has met its primary objective. As Frederick just explained, we were looking for a response rate um, equal or higher to 35 percent. So clearly 38.6 is above that. More importantly, um, Resist 1.1, one of the standard, um, um, other standard mythologies, um, the overall response rate here is 37.7%. So very consistent which, uh, with what you see with iResist. Now let's look at the OR breakdown by pd one status on slide number 17. As mentioned, the pd one status is very important for pembrolizumab alone in terms of the likelihood that the patient will respond to pembrolizumab. Firstly, it is important to note that the responses we observed were across all pd one groups. And we will come later to the benchmarking and what that means and, and what the increase is. In pd one negative patients, we saw a response rate of 28.1%. In patients with a pd one score of 1 to 49, 41.7%. And in patients with a pd one of 50 or higher, 52.6%. And the disease control rate, as also reported here, was between 68 and uh, 79%. So it's really great to see, actually, that even patients who would normally not respond, are uh, expected to respond to PEMBO, um, respond to the combination uh, therapy with FD. Importantly, the reported OR is favorable compared to historical trials of anti pd one monotherapy um, in all the different pd one subgroups, and I will guide you through that later when we come to the benchmarking. Given the trial size, the number of patients in each of the subgroups is also sizable and was one of the reasons for us to enlarge the trial. And I think um, it's very important for us to, to maybe uh, highlight that again, that based on that extension, um, we have a very robust uh, patient number in each of the groups and, and the results are really um, reliable. On the next slide, on the top chart, you see the waterfall plot by pd one levels. So the different colors represent different pd one subgroups um, and one can see that in each of the subgroups, as explained before, we see responses according to iResist and to resist. Overall, 19.4% of the patients had a decrease of, of uh, 50% or more of their, two, uh, their target lesions. And the charts tells us that the responses are deep and there's a significant decrease in the size of the tumors in all the pd one subgroups. Let's have a look at the bottom chart here on the left, the spider plot. Um, gives you an idea of the patient's or the, the tumor journey, basically, um, while the trial is, is moving along. And the, ch the chart helps us to understand the duration of response or the duration of stabilization of disease, which is equally important um, to the depth of the response, which is shown in the water waterfall plot above. The waterfall plot here, it's not split by pd one level, but by response. So the blue chart is the patient with the complete responses, the green, greenish yellow, the patients with the partial response, gray, patients with stabilization of disease, and pink, red, the patients with uh, progressive disease. And what's important take home message from that chart is that basically after six months, only very few patients have progressed when they had a response to the combination therapy. 
In numbers, 8.6% of the patients with a confirmed response progressed within the first six months until the data cutoff. And that's quite comparable to what you see with pembolism up alone. And we believe that's actually one of the key differentiating factors of IO, IO therapy compared to IO plus chemotherapy. It's maybe not as prominent in non-small cell lung cancer as in head and neck and maybe gastroesophageal cancer, but you also see it there that you get higher response rate with chemo IO, but the duration of response drops and it's very important for us to track that. And until now, this tracks really well compared to Pembrolo. Importantly, the median duration of response has not yet been reached, and obviously we will monitor that further. Turning to slide 19. Here we are looking at interim progression-free survival of the patients. This endpoint is not final yet, and we are still tracking the patients as a lot of those are still under therapy. On the left-hand side, the plot shows all 114 patients grouped together, regardless of their pdl one status. Here, the interim PFS is 6.9, so almost seven months, meaning the median time frame patients continue without getting worse is 6.9 months. If you then look on the right hand chart, we break it down by the different PDL1 um, subgroups. And the interim median PFS for those with a TPS score of 1 to 49 was 9.3 months, and it was 11.8 months for those with a PDL1 of 50% or higher. Overall, we feel that median PFS and, and Overall, and in all PDL1 subgroups, is really encouraging and supports actually um, the overall response rate results. And as discussed before, will be monitored further. Let's conclude on the data itself and let's have a look into the benchmarking. And on the next slide and, and the next two slides, actually, there are a couple of important benchmarkings to be done with this data. Um, let's start on, on slide number 20 with a comparison against pembolism of monotherapy, which was the main aim of this trial to show that FD plus PEMBRO is better than F, uh, PEMBRO, PEMBRO alone. And across two endpoints of overall response rate and PFS, and across all PDL1 subgroups, FD increased the efficacy by a large margin compared to all available historical data reported for pembolism of monotherapy in a comparable patient subset. The objective of the trial is to demonstrate that FD and PEMBO increases the overall response rate in a PDL1 unselected patient population compared to historical pembolism of monotherapy. And we have proven that this, in this case, in TAC DO2, um, is actually the case as we have met the primary objective for this patient group. The chart on the left here compares the overall response rate for FD plus PEMBO in the green bars and PEMBO alone in the blue bars. For the diff for overall, that's the first two columns, and then by the different PDL1 uh, subgroups. And as you can see, th the biggest effect, absolute, you see, and also relative, you see for patients with a PDL1 start of less than 1% or PDL1 of 1 to 49. And the same is actually true if you look on the figure on the right, where we've displayed that for median PFS. So the median PFS in 1 to 49 increases from 4.1 month to 9.3, and it increases from 7.1 month to 11.8 and above equal to 50%. And in like, really, I would like to highlight again that we are seeing the highest effects in the PD-1 low and PD-1 negative patients. And to our knowledge, FD is the only immunocology treatment with such a therapeutic effect in low and negative PD-1 NSCSC tumors, which has data not only from uh, 10, 20 patients, but in a larger patient population. On slide number 21, we make a second comparison to the current treatment landscape for patients with a PD-1 level of 1 to 49%. I think it's well known and accepted that PEMBO alone works well in PD-1 high, so above 50. Uh, expressing patients and is widely used there as a chemo free uh, option. Here we compare the overall response rate on the left and the median progression free survival on the right of FD plus PEMBO and PEMBO monotherapy, along with PEMBO uh, and the deep double chemotherapy for patients with a PDL1 level of 1 to 49%. There are two bars here for um, the PEMBO plus IO combo, uh, PEMBO plus uh, chemo combo, 
because there are different chemos for non-squamous and squamous cell cancer. On the left figure, the OR is almost comparable to what you achieve with chemo, and PFS exceeds what you see with chemo plus PEMBO. Hence, the combination of FD and PEMBO could offer a chemo-free regimen for this patient population, which with a much, much preferred safety profile, as Frederick just explained, and doable responses, something which has never been reported for an IO combination, especially not with such an excellent safety profile. And with looking at slide number 22 now, here we provide a benchmark of our results against other IO combinations in development. ORR and PFS from TACTIO2 trend favorably, and the data is more compelling than for anti tigit and anti leg 3 The FD combination benefits a much larger patient population due to its orthogonal therapeutic effects coming via the APC activation and not another um, ICI that complements the ICI effect of pembolism. Overall, we are more than pleased with the data and to maybe give you an insight from, from, from ESCO, we basically were approached by everyone um, who um, congratulated us to, to the results here at ESCO, and obviously that you know, supports our confidence in the data. I will now hand back to Mark, um, who will talk about uh, how FD is positioned in the treatment landscape. Thanks a lot, and uh, Mark, please take over. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Um, so I make it uh, rather short again. Um, this is uh, practically the slide Frederic uh, has been explaining uh, um, a few minutes ago. So the FD positioning in the treatment landscape, especially keeping in mind uh, the still high unmet medical need with the median overall survival in general below 24 months. Um, the low efficacy of uh, anti-PD-1 monotherapies for yeah, the vast majority of patients, um, so around about 70% of patients, and the compromise you need to make if you take a chemo regimen in terms usually of a shorter duration of response and a more toxic option for the patients and also more co-medication in order to cope with the tox profile. Um, so we believe that uh, overall and in the different categories, FD Lagimod uh, has uh, very good chances uh, to be positioned. Um, and I'm not aware, uh, just to, to stress what Christian has been mentioning, I'm also not aware of an IOIO combination, a PDL1 all comer clinical trial with a sizable patient population. Achieving that, it was maybe not a surprise that we got an oral presentation at ESCO uh, with the data you just have been seeing. And it's uh, noteworthy that this is interim data. So it's a primary readout of uh, the primary endpoint, meaning we have practically uh, been logging in uh, the the bar for overall response rate, um, and there is of course more to come. So we saw an overall response rate by iResist of uh, more than thirty eight percent, exceeding what we presented at ESCO last year for the thirty six patients, where we saw thirty six point one percent, and we actually expanded together with our collaboration partner, um, the first line non small cell lung cancer group in order to see, first of all, is the signal we detected holding in a larger uh, patient population? And if that's the case, to generate from the data options uh, to move further, to move uh, uh, possibly into phase three. Also, if you look um, into the data, I resist, resist 1.1, so different qualifying factors. I think we transparently <clears throat> showed it uh, at ESCO and also here. Um, there is, uh, as mentioned, more to come in terms of, uh, for instance, central read, uh, duration of response, uh, progression-free survival is uh, interim, but the very first uh, data cut from the 114 patients, um, it's fair to say that we are very excited and that uh, this excitement, I believe, is also reflected uh, in the community. So um, I would like um, to... Thank you very much for these results. A brief outlook before we turn to Q&A. Um, ESCO um, is, of course, um, not a full stop. Uh, there is a second half of this year. You will see more data coming uh, from TACTI002, for instance. Please do not forget that we have inside, in, also inside 003 and the strategic importance of inside 003, where we test 
Anti-PD-1 plus Ftilagi mod plus chemotherapy, also to have a look there, uh, has just been uh, increasing. Also, we have uh, uh, TACD-003 in first line head and neck cancer currently recruiting. Um, we uh, will uh, qualify how the study is tracking from second half of this year onwards. Um, we are working on the scale up on regulatory, of course. Um, so there's a lot to expect in terms of data and other meaningful updates also in the second half of this year. And of course, also in 2023. And there's there will be more talking points uh, around uh, Lex3 in general. So we expect uh, the BMS drug being approved. And they had a big booth here at ESCO uh, being approved in Europe. Um, uh, we expect also more data coming out of that space. Um, and um, now I will pass it back to Tim for questions uh, from analysts and also from for questions which have been uh, submitted uh, to us uh, in writing um, yeah, by the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Well, we'll now I open the call to uh, analyst questions and uh, we request that analysts just limit their questions to one at a time and you can rejoin the queue to ask a second question if you like, unless that second question is just clarifying question, in which case we'll just move ahead straight away. We've got lots of questions coming in, Mark. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll invite you to turn on your microphone when it's your turn. Uh, the first question comes from Ahir Demir, who is from Landenberg. Thank you very much for taking my question. Congratulations on the data. I do have a couple of questions, but as per Tim's request, I, I will uh, get back on the queue. I think my initial question would be, you have shown clinical activity across multiple PDL one expressions. Where do you see the sweet spot for FD? Is it the 1 to 49% separation that you show in one of the slides? And how would you position it if you would pursue the lung cancer space? Yeah, Ahu, thank you. Um, uh, that's obviously a very important, good question. Indeed, uh, I think especially uh, 1 to 49% uh, PDL1 expression where we did not see uh, an overlap of the confidence intervals between the historical uh, PEMBRO data uh, and the combination data um, is a special sweet spot without ruling out the other. So you could uh, broadly position FT Lagimod in the field on the one hand side as a chemo free option, maybe above 1% um, TPS score. Um, but uh, potentially you can also uh, include um, chemo if you look, uh, for instance, at below 1% or in an, an all comer patient population, uh, the initial safety data from inside 003 was positive. So there are actually a variety of different options. The data is so strong that unlike anti Tichet, where they needed to focus after the first data set on PDL1 high, because it was simply not really working in uh, 1 to 49 and below 1. Uh, we have a variety of different uh, development options um, uh, which we can pursue. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next question is from Andrew Payne from CSLA. Over to you, Andrew. Yeah, morning, everyone, and yeah, congrats on the uh, the data. Uh, just just a bit of a follow up to that one. So, so the one to forty nine separation. Uh, just trying to think, how material is the uplift uh, to current patients on K to monotherapy? Uh, just just you know, th thinking about. Uh, how many patients uh, you know would would respond to this uh, therapy uh, versus the, uh, the the current the treated uh, either K treated mono or K treated with chemo? Yeah, typically in terms of uh, response rate and the one to forty nine, um, you see a response of uh, around seventeen percent with pembromonal. If you look at the uh, Keynote zero zero one Keynote forty two trials. Uh, while we saw 41.7% um, uh, um, uh, and with no overlap of the confidence interval. So we would uh, actually significantly uh, increase um, uh, the uh, response rate. And we saw also an increase of uh, the median progression-free survival um, uh, by uh, uh, twofold or more than twofold. I don't know, Christian, if you would like to add to that. I think it's, um, it's important if you... Think about the patient perspectives here and that's what we try to do right we try to improve the patient's um, treatment options and in case you could offer a patient a chemo-free regimen in the first line setting um, 
not just to a buff equal to 50%, but maybe a buff equal to 1%, where actually pembolizumab is approved in the US as such. Um, you, you have more options in the second line setting then. You're not out of options as it is nowadays when you have given the triplet combination thereafter, only doxotoxel. So they, there's a lot of thoughts, um, you know, us together with the regulators, or we need to put into um, the best trial design to move forward here. But from a scientific point of view, I feel that the one to 49 really opening up a sweet spot. And I think we should not just, you know, think about non-small cell lung cancer in, like on the long run, because if you see that here, so you could also expect that this could probably, um, um, hopefully be the case in other indications. So you, you, yeah, you could enlarge the, the patient population um, eligible to chemo-free uh, treatments um, with an excellent safety profile. Thank you. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, the next question is from Tanushri Jain from Petra Capital. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, guys, and uh, congratulations on the very good data. Um, just a quick question from me. Around the squamous and non-squamous results that we've seen, uh, it doesn't look like there's been a huge difference in overall response rate on these two. Um, going forward, especially if you go against chemo and Kejuda, where they actually had two different trials for squamous and non-squamous. What would you expect uh, would be your target? Christian, would you like to take that? Yes, sure. So I think it's important to, to note that the, the main reason why there are two trials for the uh, pembolizumab and the different uh, entities for non-small cell lung cancer is the chemo backbone. So they just wanted to have a clean trial at the time um, with uh, one chemo backbone. Um, as in Keynote 42, they also enrolled, which is Pembromono, they enrolled squamous and non-squamous. If I'm not mistaken, at the same percentage we have. So whatever, whatever you, would, you, know, you would go ahead, you would probably try to, to have a trial where you could combine that in one trial. Um, and I think that's, that's what most of the competitors, competitors are doing nowadays, running a trial. Um, with both entities in, in one trial, and then obviously a mixed uh, statistical uh, assumption. So we, in long story short, we do not expect that the combination works differently um, in squamous and non-squamous. Um, obviously with the chemo, there's a little bit of a difference uh, expectation, um, but this would, this would be taken care of by uh, stratification. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Tara Speranza from uh, Bill Potter. Tara. Yeah, hi. Yeah, thanks kindly. Yeah, great results. Well done. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, uh, Imutep, I have a very similar question to the last one. I know that um, stratifying by PDL1 levels is really important for you, and I understand that, and that result was really um, clean and clear. Um, so I also wanted to know about the histological pathology and whether or not you stratified by other variants. So squamous cell and non-squamous cell, of course, was just asked in the previous, but what about adenocarcinoma or any other histological variants? Given that you sort of answered that question just now, I'm going to add in there a quick cheeky second half. Uh, what about stratifying by stage of cancer? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tara. Um, Christian, I um, hand over to you. Yeah, in, in the TACTIO2 trial, um, as reported by Frederick earlier, we had 93% with metastatic disease at study entry. So if you would expect a similar patient population in, in the phase three, which is basically all the patients have metastatic disease, so stage four, um, yeah, you, you would not stratify for that as the other group is too small, but definitely something to consider that you to know to make sure that you have um, similar um, stage of disease in all the patients in both arms. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is from Melissa Benson from uh, Wilson Advisory. Thanks very much. Um, hi, Frederick, Christian, and Mark. I just had a question around progression-free survival. So obviously, this was just an interim readout. But I mean, if we if we focus on those PDL one negative patients, that's sitting around that kind of four point two months. I mean, how should we think about kind of 
expectations and benchmarking in that particular group, given that it's, it's not that easy with some of the other trials excluding those patients. Yeah, I believe um, uh, the uh, uh, PDL1 uh, no representative uh, uh, patients um, we saw uh, an increase in terms of uh, PFS. By the way, also an increase from last year's ESCO, where we reported, if I'm not mistaken, 4.1 months and not 4.2, um, uh, which is good. Um, but of course, you can ask yourself the question if, for instance, the addition of uh, chemotherapy uh, could uh, help there, so in a triple combination or not. Um, this would be one consideration, but in any case, it's uh, 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 something where Pembromono is obviously um, not been given uh, uh, or approved. Um, and to make those patients eligible to treatment, and one needs to dig a little bit further into that, uh, could indeed be uh, um, very attractive. Um, I don't know, Christian, if you have uh, additional thoughts on that. I think it's, as you just mentioned in outline, I think it's very hard to compare to anything as there's just Keynote 01 with a you know, very small number of patients. But there was a good reason why this wasn't you know, further developed. So you can expect that uh, whatever you compare it to is basically zero activity um, or let's say 10%, around about 10% response rate, um, but probably a PFS, which is very inferior. Um, and how to take that forward I think it's it's something to be to be seen. I think first of all, it's it's interesting to have this positive signal on the overall response rate side of things. Thank, Thank you. you. The ne next question is from Dennis Holm, who is from Tyler Collisons. Dennis, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is probably uh, more for Frederick and Christian. Um, with the K-Trid and monotherapy benchmark data, that's based on confirmed response rates. So once you adjust for the proportion of confirmed responses in the FD combo trial, if you can compare that to K-Trid and monotherapy, looks like there's only modest benefit compared to the, in the PDL1 high group, but a very strong benefit in the intermediate PDL1 expression group. In contrast, in head and neck cancer, the biggest benefit you saw was in the PDL1 high expressing group. So, what do you make of that uh, difference? And does it tell you anything about the way FD works in different cancers or different patient populations? Thank you. Christian or Frederic? I can, I can start. Um, so, maybe let's start with confirmed versus unconfirmed. So, obviously, this trial here is ongoing. Um, and um, so most of the responses as reported have already been confirmed and uh, other responses may come on top of that and um, the responses which have not yet been confirmed, they may still be confirmed and uh, there's high likelihood that this will be the case. <clears throat> Second, um, looking into Keynote 01, which is a um, you know, major contributor here, um, I tried to find it actually out and um, drink it, drilling deep into, you know, the SAP and the protocols. And it, it looks to me that the, re, um, the response rate um, MSD reported at the time was not confirmed, but unconfirmed, um, as they just want to confirm a report, the confirmed response rate with the final data, but they, re, they, they brought out the paper three months after last patient in, so or probably not the final data. Um, but it's just off note. Um, I think there's a key difference between um, non-small cell lung cancer and head and neck. This is TPS, so tumor proportional score, and the combined proportional score, um, CPS, um, in, in head and neck. So I, I think comparisons between the two trials are rather difficult. And another caveat is that in the TACTIO2 trial, the negative patients were just a very few. Um, top of my head, I think it's five patients with a you know cps negative score um so it's very difficult to actually um draw that comparison and the 1 to 19 looked pretty well in 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 the head and neck space as well so the way we see fd working on top of pembolism up as pointed out today in the presentation is that you increase the number of t-cells in the tumor you increase the interferon gamma signature and thereby probably increase uh, the PDL1 expression in the tumor, hence pembolizumab works better. But uh, Frederick, maybe you want to comment on the on the scientific side of things. Um. Yes, sure. Um, 
I think from an immunological perspective, it is clear that uh, non-small cell lung cancer is more immunogenic than head and neck, and uh, there are many more uh, neoantigen there. And therefore, uh, PEMBRO is uh, more likely to work in um, non-small cell lung cancer with uh, high TPS, the so-called whole tumor, uh, uh, hot tumors. Uh, while in um, head and neck, even so, uh, patients may express a uh, high level of uh, um, PDL1. Uh, maybe uh, you may consider these patients are a sort of a tepid tumor comparable to what you see in uh, 1 to 49 percent uh, TPS uh, in uh, NLCLC. So, uh, so it's, it, that may be why uh, uh, um, FT is, seems to work well in uh, head and neck, uh, even in, uh, we, in patients with uh, uh, a high uh, CPS score. That, that's one way to look at it, but uh, of course I have no uh, definitive answer on that. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. There's a, a further question here from on, on email from Jackie de Donda. Uh, she says, congratulations on the phase two tactic uh, 002 data. I would like to hear from management how they plan to approach phase three strategically. If the data is that convincing, why wouldn't Merck take over the trial? Yeah, that's of course uh, um, an important question. On the one hand side, you have the results. Uh, and then on the other hand side, um, you have uh, a number of strategic options. Um, so let me uh, say one thing very, very clear. Um, so we will uh, not uh, go crazy. And I said it before ASCO, I will say it uh, thereafter. Uh, and uh, start now on our own uh, multiple different phase three clinical trials and risk our uh, existing cash life, which we, by the way, extended in the last activities report to the beginning of 2024. So we will, uh, we will take that uh, as a, a very important number, especially in a market like this, where I would also, and I did that uh, before ESCO, and I will do it thereafter, I would like to clearly rule out any short-term uh, capital raise. Of course, this can't be an indefinite statement, um, but um, we are, um, of course, uh, not pleased with the share price right now. This may be as a private comment here. Uh, but there are a variety of different uh, options. First of all, uh, we have options within our existing budget. Uh, we carefully uh, uh, planned and allocated our resources we said publicly that we are going to expand our uh, FT Lagimod uh, pipeline on the one hand side horizontally, meaning uh, potential additional signal detection studies and other indications. Uh, and on the other hand side, we have been talking about a phase three, to be more precise about a phase three in metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and if we can entertain uh, one phase three, um, then we have to make uh, choices and we have to uh, take the right priorities. Um, and uh, we will, in very due course, um, inform the market about the priorities. I think uh, it's uh, pretty clear that uh, non-small cell lung cancer is a commercially a more attractive uh, target uh, than uh, uh, the space in metastatic breast cancer, where we saw also some more data coming at ESCO. Uh, so there could be, the final decision needs to be taken by the board, but there could be a certain tendency uh, towards non-small cell lung cancer. These are options within our own control. Now, in addition, of course, um, uh, data talks uh, and the talks uh, to the community. The data has been published at Friday. Um, the Christian made the comment uh, that um, we have been approached or we have a number of meetings. And of course, um, you can do clinical trials alone, or you can do it in collaboration. Actually, TACTI002 is done in collaboration with Merck, um, where uh, we have uh, uh, with Merck and uh, with others discussions. So you can assume that there are meetings, you can assume that the data and the press releases have been reviewed and so on and so forth. So there are, of course, also uh, usual um, options, opportunities um, um, within the normal parameters of our industry from licensing, um, the uh, question indicated a takeover. Um, obviously, M&A this year, we all noted the deals uh, with uh, Sierra Oncology, and we noted the deal 
uh, in the APC activator space. If the Lagimod is an APC, there was been a transaction uh, of Checkmate Pharmaceuticals being acquired by Regeneron for four times the share price. Um, so we are, of course, uh, 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 not blind. Um, we need to see, we need to assess the different options and uh, this might not be uh, the place to speculate uh, too much around that, but of course we are fully aware of all different strategic options. But I would like to clearly point to our cash life, uh, to our commitment to work carefully and in a responsible manner uh, uh, with the funds we have been entrusted with, just to make that very clear. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have a couple more analyst questions. Uh, one from uh, Ahud Demir, over to you. Thank you very much. Taking my question again. Uh, this time I wanted to ask, Christian did a great job putting the FT combination in comparison to the benchmark. I would be interested in hearing after the ASCO presentations as we saw a mixed bag of uh, lung cancer data, Maris data was favorable, IMAP was not favorable. So just curious how you think FT combination compares to other combinations as well. So Christian, that's directly to you. I think given the data been released here at ESCO, um, I think we, we can be very confident with the data we have been reported here um, in such a large patient subset of more than 100 patients. I haven't seen um, data which comes near to what we have reported here, especially not in the you know, uh, pd one negative or pd one intermediate patient population and without um, adding any chemotherapy. Um, it's, it's definitely an evolving field. Um, but I think we can be very confident um, as we also work with pembolizumab, which is the, obviously the strongest um, PD-1 antibody um, in the market. Thank you. Um, a further question from Tanishree Jain from Petro Capital. Thanks, guys, for taking a follow-up question. Um, this is just uh, talking about strategically. Um, you know, given that, you know, we've seen some digit data where a phase two was really successful and then the phase three didn't work out, um, do you think there would be, you know, especially because, you know, we've got two different kind of PDL1 expressions to look at. We've also worked at the high expresses where the benchmark is K2DA monotherapy. We've also worked in the 1 to 49% expression where the benchmark is really K2DA plus chemo. Do you think, given that there might be any merit in going for, say, two phase 2B trials versus a phase 3 immediately? We could just kind of you know, discuss around that. I believe um, that. Um... We have indeed um, different options to go to late stage development. Um, we um, feel, and maybe uh, it's fair to say that maybe also some others feel that the data would indeed uh, support uh, different uh, phase three options. Um, we have been discussing some of those options directly or indirectly during the call. Um, you could of course also uh, go into a, another randomized setting, biotech, um, time to market um, and the robot robustness of the data could speak for a direct uh, phase three option uh, within everything I uh, have been mentioning um, uh, two, three minutes ago. So I can't give you a definitive answer, um, but uh, we will uh, make up our mind. But I believe uh, we have the option to go to phase three, but from clinical development point of view, uh, there would be, of course, also uh, other options as well. Yeah. And just one more question, if I may squeeze in here. Um, just with your chemo plus FT plus anti-PD-1 trial that you mentioned is going to report also sometime this year, do you think that would be enough of uh, you know, data for you to go directly into a phase three with chemo plus FT plus k -truda, or do you envisage you need to do a safety run-in before you do that? I believe the 20 patients from a safety perspective uh, are already a, a sizable group. We have, of course, also experience with the chemo combination, different chemo 
uh, in uh, metastatic breast cancer. Uh, but we should look first of all at the data if uh, the safety profile remains as clean as we reported in December. Um, so where that was the first time we have been mentioning uh, some data out of uh, the triple combination, and it was very favorable for the triple combination. Um, but uh, I would prefer to look at the data first uh, before I can uh, further comment. Great, thank you. Thank Hope you. that's okay. Um, Mark, just one last question from Melissa Benson. Melissa, over to you. Oh, apologies. I um. I will ask one more question. Just why you guys um, have chosen the I resist versus the resist 1.1? 1 .1. Um, obviously, you, you do both comparisons, but just remind us again, please. Yeah, maybe Christian, if you go back in, in time when we started. Yeah, the main reason is it's easier to also continue treatment beyond progression. You could implement it as well with Vesis, but it's much easier as it is already foreseen. Um, with I resist, and it makes a lot of sense if you just have, you know, IO, IO combi uh, combination therapies. Wouldn't probably make much sense if you have a chemotherapy in there as well. And that was the main reason to, to do so. But uh, as, as we have reported uh, today and, and on Friday, um, the, there's not a big difference between those two, but uh, gives the, the investigator a better flexibility. Might just squeeze in one last question from Dennis Holm. Dennis, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, just in relation to you know, potential late stage clinical investigation, I note that in the NCCN guidelines for uh, intermediate PDL1 expression 1 to 49, they say that Pembro monotherapy is useful, useful for patients the uh, Cotruda Kembo chemo combo. So it really looks like there's potential for potentially a pivotal trial versus for the combo versus Pembro monotherapy. Um, now, do you think that that's a potential path that you might go and how attractive does that option look to you, particularly in comparison to the breast cancer alternative? In terms of the, of, uh, uh, the general alternative, um, again, we would need to make a, a decision at the uh, board level, of course, about the prioritization, but uh, I think I indicated already that uh, um, it's really interesting uh, to look at non-small cell lung cancer and to potentially move forward uh, there, but we will do a very rational uh, process around that. And uh, uh, Christian, would you like uh, to comment on the first half uh, of the question? Yeah, I think, um, thanks Dennis for the question. I think, you know, it, in, especially in, in the US, it's approved and, and as you just mentioned, it, it's probably used predominantly in patients who cannot tolerate um, the chemo IO setting, the, the main benefit if we add FD to it is that you get the same efficacy as you get with the chemo. So you probably would also try to um, have those patients on the trial as well. And I think it's, it's, it would be the natural and quite an interesting um, study setting to, to look for that. Um, but obviously needs to be discussed with, with a lot of different uh, stakeholders. Right. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, th thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll now hand back to Mark for his concluding remarks. Just, uh, uh, Tim, I don't know if you mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, um, that there were also some questions from the audience. Uh, at least we should maybe uh, take two of those. And, sure, Mark. Uh, sure, Mark. Um, there's a question here for Tactic002. Do the subgroups of AIPAC experience high clinical benefit from receiving FD. Uh, put differently, is there any crossover subgroups from APAC to TACTI 002 that would support FD biomarkers? Yeah, indeed, we have been reporting, and, and thanks for that question, we have been uh, reporting uh, some biomarker data uh, in early May, uh, May uh, from APEC um, in terms of increase of CD8, CD4, CLCX10, uh, level of monocytes, uh, we have been discussing also um, the absolute lymphocyte count. There could be some uh, read-through. Um, we need to um, analyze um, more data, also more data from the TACTI series. Um, but uh, even though there's, of course, a different combination, there could be some uh, read-through in terms of uh, uh, different biomarkers need to be evaluated if there uh, would be likely adjustments um, in terms of the combination. But there could be something, maybe Frederic. Uh, if you have uh, an additional comment there. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, looking at subgroups is always interesting, but here, in contrast to APAC, uh, we don't have the passive or group. Uh, so we cannot really analyze uh, whether uh, uh, younger patients would respond better to, uh, uh, to the combination uh, compared to uh, uh, Pembro alone. Uh, because if you do that, uh, you really have, uh, uh, by definition, small subgroups. And, uh, compared to historical trials. So it's, 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 it's much more difficult than uh, in a clean uh, clinical setting uh, such as uh, APAC. Thank but that you. could come, of course, from TACTI-003. But Tim, back to you. Yeah, just a further last question. Uh, what, what is your opinion on the adverse event rate for Dyspina compared to Pembro alone or Pembro plus chemo? where grade two and above Dyspina warrants sending a patient in for a scan of the lungs. Frederic, that might be for you. Well, um, as said before, our patients, 93% of them are metastatic and uh, Dyspnea is a very uh, common uh, symptom in uh, these uh, patients due to the uh, underlying diseases. So, uh, I don't have any uh, concern about uh, the percentage uh, you have seen on the slides. Uh, I don't see why we should con be concerned about that. And of course, uh, in case of severe dyspnea, uh, another CT scan uh, will be performed uh, for sure. Thanks, Mark. That's all the questions from the floor. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and on behalf of the Immutep uh, team, I would like to thank everyone for listening today. Um, I hope we have been uh, able to share some of the excitement we see, to share some of the strategic options we are having. And um, just as a reminder, the webcast will, of course, be uh, available in due course on our website. And again, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>